Hello, poetry lovers and poetry curious. Today I'm going to read you some poems from Ink Suite by Sarah J. Sloat. So this was published in 2013 by Dancing Girl Press. This, and I'm going to read you what, four poems from this, and I'm going to read them to you all in this one video because this chat book is just a little book, what, 25 pages, 26, I don't even know because there's no page numbers on it, 20, 25 pages, something like that. It's kind of all of a piece, <clears throat> which is probably why she titled it Ink Suite. A suite of things about ink. In this case, at least at the start, about fonts. So I will read to you from another chat book by um, Sarah Sloat that highlights her tendency to be surrealist and to enliven things that we wouldn't normally enliven. In this case, she is giving life to fonts. So it's like she used them, uses them as an avenue to create stories. So I don't know that everybody who has encounters this video will have had the experience of reading a nice book, as in like not a trade paperback, where someplace in the front or the back of the book they give credit for the font, where the font came from, who invented it, who created it. You know, wild varieties of fonts are every day now on our computers and so we probably don't think about that. But in print it was often, fonts were often given credit. And so she starts this volume with what is essentially nonsense <laughs> because there was no special font used in the making of this book but she creates a story of a font to open this chat book and set of poems so I'm going to read you that opening story of a font and I'm going to read I think I don't know if there's There's at least one more that is another story of a font. Yeah. And she's got others in here, but not necessarily ones that I'm going to read to you. And then others that are just about being bookish. Okay. So here we go. A note on the text. This book is set in Crevacour, a typeface named for Robert Crevacour, who kept a print shop in the 14th arrondissement, or arrondissement, I don't know, <laughs> from 1637 to 1649. His father apprenticed him as a youth to an engraver of gun barrels and cannons. In the infamous duel of 1634, his trim script etched the pistol that killed the traitor René Mabuse, or Mabuse or goodness knows, I can't pronounce French. So here we go. I mean, it starts out making sense, and this is what I would call a prose poem. Okay, she's got three paragraphs here. So it starts out being believable, and then um, moves on in ways that are less credible. <laughs> <laughs> and less about the typeface. Um, so, Crevacour soon turned to typesetting. Convinced letters possessed gender, affinities for particular colors and in certain combinations corresponded to recurring planetary constellations. Crevacour's treatise on the printed words superiority to and ultimate triumph over death made him the premier letter cutter of his time. A masterpiece that marks a tragedy. The typeface known as Crevacore was designed shortly before its creator succumbed to a cult of Flemish punch cutters. 
who believed books were best left to the select. This triggered Crevacour's decline into the cryptic, rendering his later work into the cryptic. Okay, this triggered Crevacour's de decline into the cryptic, rendering his later work illegible. Oh my goodness. So there you go. The next typeface, the poem is called Typeface Number 54. The type used to set this book, Sonidia, was created by an obscure order of Florentine nuns in the 16th century. Living in close quarters, the sisters designed Sonia. Does that even mean dream? Sonia, S-O-G-N-I? I believe this is Italian, except it has D-H, which I don't think of as Italian, so I don't know what it is. Um, Sonia Dia in, um, okay, the sisters designed Sonia Dia in italics to evoke intimacy and in an inclination to bend to God's will. The ascendant letters, L, K, H, etc., slenderly loop, while those with bowls, A, Q, O, etc., ellipse. Sonia Dia is traditionally printed in lower case as a nod to modesty and inconsequence. <laughs> Dense, but with room to breathe, Sonia Dia bears a sharp serif and survives in modern times as the choice of writers who seek both to atone for and to glorify the shortcomings of their work. <laughs> oh, I love, I love her imagination. All right. So there's typeface number 54 by the Florentine nuns. The next one. I'm going to read to you is called Reading While Walking. When the book opens, the street shuts down. The story unscrolls from all sides. It drops its thoughts along shorn lawns. It splits, oh, it splits ways with the real day. It freights the air. The walker strays. When the book opens, the street shuts down. The mind dowses, drinking at the page. Eyes trip and linger on the doubling curve. The walk meanders and the walk moves straight. Leafing fills the air with a whir of birds. Pages layer and pages turn. The mind lolls down the rungs of words. When the book opens, the street shuts down. There is no fiction. There is no world. So here we have um, Sarah, the poet, in a more serious tone or mood. I like how, I'm not sure I have ever read while walking. I don't think but that is something that I personally could do. <laughs> Just one of my personal limitations. Um, but I like that she keeps re repeating when the book opens, the street shuts down. And talks about how the book takes over and the mind kind of gives into it. And then in the end, there is no fiction. There was, I think I said there is no world. It's there is no fiction, there was no world. In other words, the fiction is no longer fiction, it's your reality, and the world that was has disappeared. So I just, I just think she does a marvelous job of depicting how we get, we, how we get lost in a book. And the last one I'm going to read to you from this book is, or this chapbook, so it is a book, chapbook, 
is called Bedside Books. No librarian can recount how it came to such a random stacking. They smuggled dust, trafficked flap, and strange arrangements. Being bedful bedfellows, they mixed their fictions, but of origin they didn't have the faintest, not the foggiest bibliography. In some tortured lore it said they arrived in clutches. Plotters, yes, but unprepared. Disembarking, they were detained while those vested checked their papers. Idle, poised to loiter, they built asymmetrical cities of high-rise and shantytown, smokestack and minaret, more balustrade than buttress, less way station than common grave. Some came by chance, assembling one by one, overnight like the freight of poltergeist. But some were sentenced for years, sometimes for life. <laughs> so just a new way to look at the stack by your bed <laughs> or in a library as, as immigrants or uh, refugees who have assembled kind of without fully, without intention or will and how they are managing to cope with their status, which could last for years or for life. So yeah, I really love Sarah, Sarah's imagination and her way to turn everyday things into something interesting, tragic, with a life of its own. And you're going to see that in the next book that I read to you from by Sarah. Take care, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.